This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, Episode 2, September 26, 2008. I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm back with Dick Despommiers. Hello, Vince. How are you doing, Dick? I'm doing well. We're here in Dick's office at Columbia University, right near the George Washington Bridge, in fact. And today, it's very cloudy and rainy. Dick has a lot of glass in his office. (laughs) He's a lucky guy. We can see the bridge, uh, and it's raining. And it's been raining uh, most of the night. That's right. So would you say that this is going to put a damper on the West Nile season in this area? Not if I'm a bird, it's not. <laughs> but if, but if I'm you're a human, a human, it will. Absolutely right. <laughs> so to pick up on last week's uh, j- uh, talk just briefly, when the rains come, it stops the human cycling, correct? Exactly. So maybe today will be the end, and we're in the end of September, so we'll see. We'll keep track. One of the things we want to do on this netcast is to find weekly events in virology and talk about them. By the way, just to update the West Nile, over the last week, there were 100 more cases recorded in the United States from this outbreak. Where were they? Mostly in California and Texas, mostly the hot, dry sections of the country. Very good. We'll keep an eye on that. We'll, we'll check ProMed mail. We'll see how it's going. Today, we're talking about polio. Right. This and is your we, subject. Vince. And this is my subject. So these first two sessions, we've been, we're talking about things we know very well. Dick, you knew West Nile well since you wrote the book on West Nile. Today, I, work, I have worked on polio virus, which causes polio, the disease, for 25 or more years. So, uh, Vince, let me ask you some questions. Ask me, why are we talking about polio? Well, I want to ask you the first question. Okay. When, did we, when did we ever know about polio? When, who was the first person to say, this is polio and not something else? Well, we're, that's a wonderful question. And the thing that comes to my mind is a carving of an Egyptian um, priest from thousands of years B.C., And this priest has a uh, leg which is limp and hanging, which looks like a leg that's been paralyzed by polio. Wow. So you think this has been around a while then? It's been around for many, many years. That was probably the first recorded case of polio. And it occurred, and you can find in the historical literature references to a disease that looks like polio for many, many, many years. In fact, if you look at the paintings of Peter Brickle and Hieronymus Bosch, there are many people with deformities in those paintings, and sure. they could have had polio. Right. But it wasn't until the 1700s that physicians began to see this as a clinical entity. And, in fact, it was given a name, poliomyelitis, because it was a paralytic disease of the gray matter. And then uh, it increased, it became more visible as physicians began to look for it, and there was a lot of research going on for many, many years, and Then about the turn of the 20th century, about 1900 or so, it started to occur in epidemic form. Uh So it went from a sporadic disease here and there to an epidemic form. How do you account for that? So, Dick, this is called a disease of modern sanitation. Right. And around the turn of the 20th century is when sanitation began to really improve significantly in many European and American cities. No more open sewers, no more dumping sewage on the street. Do do your listeners know who was the father, so to speak, of modern sanitation? The father of modern sanitation. Who would that be? Well, I'll give you a hint. It's raining right now, but if it was colder, it would probably be snowing. <laughs> Perhaps we can talk about John Snow for just a brief minute. <laughs> who is John Snow, Dick? Uh, John Snow, come on, you know who John Snow was. He was the guy in England who supposedly interrupted an outbreak of cholera by smashing over an old water pump on Broad Street back Correct. in the middle of the 1800s and said, it's in the water, it's in the water. So everybody started to pay attention after that. So I think I would say, at least from an epidemiologic standpoint, that 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 was the beginning of thinking about sanitation. Well, that was important for polio because polio, the virus, we'll talk in a moment about the disease. It's caused by a virus that's transmitted through feces. Right. And uh, if you improve sanitation, you're going to cut down transmission. Yep. So for thousands of years since the Egyptians or maybe before... Everyone was infected at a very young age with this virus because the sewage was everywhere and everyone was infected. But when you're infected at a very, very young age, an infant, as soon as you're born, 
you're not likely to get disease. There is some, but not likely. When you improve sanitation, you no longer are infected as a baby, Hmm. and you delay infection till perhaps five, six years old, adolescence, and then the disease is much more severe. Can the mother actually confer protection on the fetus by a maternal antibody? So if the mother has been infected and she has antibodies, she will pass antibodies to the fetus and they will last for a month or two. Okay. And then uh, the infant will be susceptible. But uh, at the turn of the 20th century, this is what happened. We started to have delay in infection. There weren't so many, many infections as infants. You now had delay of infection and buildup of susceptible individuals. And now when the virus is intr- introduced into those populations, we had outbreaks. We had epidemics. So you'd call that an unintended consequence of, of sanitation, wouldn't you? Exactly. <laughs> These are the things that happen when civilization proceeds. So in the United States, at least, when do you think the first big outbreak of polio was that really alerted the public to the fact that this is a problem we need to address? So the first significant outbreak in the U.S. was in Vermont, just around the turn of the 20th century. There were not many cases, less than 100, I would say, but Mm -hmm. this alerted the public health officials in the U.S. to this disease. Right. Previously, there had been some outbreaks in Sweden, and there were Swedish physicians who studied the disease right. and uh, made important contributions. And then this outbreak occurred in Vermont. There was subsequently one in New York of a few hundred cases. And then they became occurring with more frequency and they became bigger and bigger. How did they know this wasn't something like um, salmonella, a bacterial disease? How did they know it was a virus? Initially, we didn't. Um, but in 1909, uh-huh. a physician in Germany showed that it was a virus by making a extract from the spinal cord of a child that had died from the disease. He filtered it to remove all bacteria and Uh showed that what went through the filter could infect monkeys. So Mm -hmm. he was the first to isolate poliovirus. And so that's the classic definition of a virus, something that can pass through a filter that will retain other microorganisms like bacteria and fungi. Great. 1909, and that began the race for making a polio vaccine. Uh Uh-huh. And with increasing outbreaks in all cities of the U.S., peaking in New York, 20 to 30,000 cases a year, mostly seasonal, occurring in summer, uh, huge fear of sending your kids out to the parks or to swimming pools because you would get polio. Uh, there was a huge impetus to make a vaccine, but it wasn't until the 50s that vaccines were made and licensed and used. So, Vince, what was the seminal discovery that allowed that vaccine to actually be made? The seminal discovery was in 1949 by three individuals working at Johns Hopkins University, John Enders, Weller, and Robbins. And they showed for the first time that they could grow poliovirus in cultured cells in the laboratory. Previously, it had been very difficult to do this. Uh, People grew the virus in animals, largely monkeys, which was very inconvenient. And so they were able to grow it in cultured cells, and that laid the way for growing enough virus to make a vaccine. Right. So then at that point, now I'm a little bit confused because I know there are two kinds of vaccines. So maybe you can tell us what the difference is between both of those approaches that use the same cell cultures to develop different strategies for actually controlling polio. So the first vaccine to be licensed in the U.S. was developed by Jonas Salk. And Jonas Salk was an MD. He obtained his MD from New York University, right here near us. And he he went to Michigan after getting his MD and worked with someone on influenza vaccines. And he developed a killed or a non-infectious influenza virus vaccine, which was very successful. Uh, I believe it was mainly for military use at the time. And then he set up his own laboratory, and he had the idea of making a vaccine against polio because, after all, it was the disease of the day. Right. If we think of AIDS today and the scare that it puts into the world, this was polio in the 50s. So Salk began making a vaccine, and he followed what he had done for flu. He tried making a killed vaccine. He grew the virus in the cultures that John Enders had described, 
and he grew enough of it, inactivated it so it was not infectious, and injected it into people. And in fact, this was a very successful vaccine licensed and distributed in 1955 uh, in the United States. So who, who were the people getting this vaccine? Who was he trying to protect the most from becoming infected with this virus? Uh, all children were given this vaccine initially. There were huge vaccination days where uh, every child in school would, would be immunized. And this significantly uh, dropped the number of polio cases from about twenty to 30,000 a year in the U.S. to one or 2,000 a year by, mm -hmm. say, 1960. So why would we need another kind of vaccine if this one works so well? Well, that's a very good question. Many people in the U.S. felt we didn't. But while Salk was working, Albert Sabin, uh, another MD who also trained uh, in New York City, uh, felt that to really eliminate polio, one would have to mimic the natural infection, uh. which is to make a live uh. infectious vaccine. So he, in the 50s, developed a, a very good vaccine against polio, which you would drink, and it would replicate in your intestines and provide immunity to infection. And he went to the U.S. Public Health Service with this vaccine, and they said, sorry, we have a good vaccine. We don't really need this at the moment. Was there a difference then between vaccine A and vaccine B in terms of the longevity of the immunity that you might engender by being exposed to these two varieties of virus? Well, this is a good question. There has been, as you might imagine, a lot of debate about this. Uh, so oh, you've been at the center of that, as I recall. I have, I've watched it, having worked on polio, I've watched it. We've done some research in this area, so right. I've been very interested. Uh, nowadays, there are preparations of the killed Salk vaccine, which are very potent, and they will, with a few doses, you'll have lifelong immunity. A few doses? Yeah. Ah, that's an important Three doses. Right? Well, with the live vaccine, you also need three doses, and you also uh -huh. have lifelong immunity. So I think the duration of immunity is the same for both vaccines, although back then it may not have been. So how you deliver these to the vaccines, though, is part of social marketing. As I recall, uh, one of them is an injectable. The killed is the an injectable, other right, is an right. oral, right. with a whole lump of sugar. Is Much a easier fact. to take, yeah. yes. Little kids, if you were a little kid, which one would you have well, preferred? of course you would love the lump of sugar. And if <laughs> you look at the photos from Absolutely. the 50s of the first children being immunized, yeah. they're looking at these very large needles. <laughs> yeah, that's and right. uh, in those days, there that's were glass right. syringes with sure. long needles, which were reused, of course. And, yeah, uh, exactly. There was no effort made to ease the process. Nope. At all. They used an army-like technique. Exactly. <laughs> Pull up your sleeve, rub it with alcohol, That's right. and poke that needle in. Yeah. So clearly the uh, oral vaccine is, is much easier to take and to distribute. Are there um, disadvantages of the oral vaccine then? Well, yes, there are disadvantages. It's a live vaccine, and it, and it multiplies in your intestine, and um, it will cause polio in a very small fraction of individuals oh. who receive the vaccine. And uh, yeah. this is one of the problems with this vaccine. It has always been, uh, and we don't see this with the killed vaccine because it's not infectious. It does not replicate. What is the killed vaccine preserved in that allows it to remain active? I mean, do they have preservatives that everybody objects to now with regards to any vaccine? Well, you know, the killed vaccine is made by treating virus with formalin, which is a chemical which inactivates the vaccine. Right. Okay? And then... Um, it's stable and it's antigenic. In other words, when injected into you, it will make right. antibodies. Right. Uh, it is at one time it was preserved right. with various ad additives, which aren't present any longer, and which, as you know, okay. are the center of a big yeah. controversy, which, which perhaps we will discuss another time. Sure. But both vaccines need to remain frozen. The live vaccine um, has the advantage that it will grow in your intestines and it produces immunity in your intestines. Ah. The, the killed vaccine doesn't do that. It's injected into your arm and makes antibodies in your blood. So, so there's a local ecology to all of this. There is a local ecology. There's a very big difference because if you have a population immunized with only the killed vaccines, their intestines can still be infected with polio virus. Oh. There. Whereas if the population is immunized with the live vaccine, the virus cannot infect them. So let's say now the U.S. is only using killed vaccine. We have a lot of intestines that are susceptible to right. infection. One could imagine polio being introduced here, which it probably is daily, and spreading in the intestines of people. Nothing will happen because everyone's immunized. But perhaps one day it will find someone who is not immunized 
and it will cause polio. Because as you know, not everyone in the U.S. receives polio vaccine. Exactly. Now, I want to back up a minute because sure. <clears throat> obviously I was the star of your show for the last two episodes. <laughs> I, we were the, There's only two of us, so believe me, there's either I'm the star or you're the star. <laughs> we'll have to bring other people. Oh, in, we would we? love to do this. So, so as I was talking about West Nile virus, I was talking about it as an infection of mosquitoes, of frogs, of fish, of... I didn't mention fish, but they can be infected also. Birds and people and most mammals. What about polio? How does that differ from West Nile in that sense? Polio, as far as we know, is exclusively an infection of people. Uh, there are no animal hosts, no insect vectors, no animal reservoirs. Does that offer an advantage in this case? An advantage to the virus? To eliminating it. Yeah, to, of course, <laughs> to eliminating it. It's a right. great advantage because if you can stop transmission in people... Uh, you have the chance of eliminating the virus completely because it cannot hide anywhere. Right. Whereas West Nile, we will never be able to That's eliminate, right. correct? Exactly because it's right. in animals yep. and, and Unless, insects. of course, there's a thermonuclear... No, we won't go there. No, it does not do that. <laughs> no, it doesn't help us. But yes, polio. And as you know, there is a campaign now to eradicate polio right. because of this characteristic. We have excellent vaccines yep. and there's only a human reservoir. So... Uh, well, actually, there's one more reservoir that we're not discussing so much, I think, and that's the natural environment. Yes. What about survival in just the estuary or in uh, cesspools or in uh, septic tanks? Or what about the natural uh, history of this infection? Right. So polio uh, is excreted in the feces. When you get it, you ingest it, it grows in your intestines in huge amounts, and you excrete it in the feces. And this is the idea of how children pass it to one another in the summer when they're playing. They're a little bit dirty and they touch each other. They pass the infection. There may be a respiratory component, hmm. in, in, especially in developed countries that have good sanitation. Uh -huh. There may be a respiratory component of spread. But certainly in, in poor countries with bad sanitation, it's passed through the sewage. Right. You ingest the virus and then you excrete it in the feces, so that's how it's transmitted. But then the feces, of course, go in the sewers, right. and eventually the sewers make it into aquifers. Right. So you have, water, you have water with poliovirus. How long can it last? Well, studies have been done in, in several countries. In Japan, they immunize three times a year against polio. They use the live vaccine. And then every time they immunize, they look in the water wow. in the sewage treatment plants for the appearance of the virus. So they can track from the time the people are immunized, they can see it in the sewage treatment plants, and then they can ask how long does it last. And really, mo mostly a few months, but at the most a year, it will last in the environment. That's a long time, though. It is a long time, probably only special cases. So you have the possibility, if you stop immunizing, you could see the virus burn out eventually, say within a year. Wow. But there are other reservoirs, <coughs> unfortunately, which Tell confound this. Yeah. There are some people... Now, the way the immunization program works, within the first month of life, you're immunized with polio vaccines. In the U.S., we use killed vaccines now. We should talk about that. Why We used to use live vaccines, but we'll talk about that. Sure. In other countries uh, where the live vaccine is used, and in the U.S., before we stopped using the live vaccine, you don't ask you don't check people uh, people's health status before immunizing them because they're they're a month sure. or so of age yep many a number of people have uh, immune defects they lack antibodies oh. they have b cell deficiencies it's called and when they receive the live polio vaccine it grows in them as it would normally but it doesn't right. stop uh. they don't get polio but they excrete vaccine so they're called for years typhoid mary Carriers. They're carriers. That's right. And they wow. can, it has been documented that some of these individuals can shed wow. polio in the feces for up to 10 years. They are largely only present in developed countries, as far as we know. We don't really know how many there are, but they could pose a threat if one day we could of stop course. immunizing. Absolutely. Correct? You so. bet. So tell us some more about the virus itself. I mean, what kind of a virus is this anyway? Polio virus is a... Uh, a, what we call a small RNA-containing virus. It's made up of a pure protein shell. Mm -hmm. It's among the smaller viruses. And its genetic material is a mo molecule of ribonucleic acid. Uh -huh. So it differs from the DNA that you and I have in our genes. It, uh, the, this, this genome, as we call it, of poliovirus encodes for about a dozen proteins, uh, the proteins that make up the shell of the virus and other proteins that the virus needs to multiply 
Does this give an advantage to certain viruses? I mean, there are DNA viruses, right? And then there are RNA viruses. What's what's the difference when they go into a cell? Does one get a jump start because they've already got the RNA there? They just start making proteins? I mean, what is the process here? Well, in the case of polio, the RNA goes into a cell relatively quickly and begins making proteins immediately. And in fact, the life cycles of viruses differ in length quite dramatically from eight hours or so for polio to 24 hours or more for some viruses. So polio is among the quicker of the viruses. So it's already tooled up to go. It's ready to go. The RNA comes out of the protein shell. It goes into the, into the cell, and it begins making proteins and making more RNAs. It's among the fastest replicating animal viruses. Clever little devils. Quite clever, but it's not clever by design, by evolution, of course. There are, of course, uh, disadvantages to having a ge- an RNA genome in terms of the vaccines because mm-hmm. RNA virus make a lot of mistakes and they don't right. correct them. Right. All viruses, when they grow, make mistakes <coughs> in, in copying their genes. So could you, for these carrier states, for instance, if you could identify somebody that's in that category, couldn't you just use an inhibitory RNA molecule to shut down the whole process and cure them? Of course. There are many ways that you could... Uh, eliminate the infection from these individuals, antiviral drugs, inhibitory molecules, etc. The key is to identify them. There's right. no way to do this. And the few that have been studied were identified uh, accidentally. Ah. And do so, we, you know, if there are dozens or hundreds in the U.S., we'd have no way of finding do them. Do we understand the immune defect that allows this to happen? Yes, they, they don't make antibodies at all. None? No. So they are of more susceptible class? to certain infections. No. Well, how do they survive then? Um, they have they have cellular immunity, which is is very good at recovering from infections. There are some people that don't make secretory immunoglobulins, yes. and that has a, a, a consequence also for certain right. diseases. So these individuals are called a gamma globulinemics. These are su- yeah. these are severe immune deficient individuals. Only then. for antibody molecules. They have they have gotcha. cellular immunity. Oh, no, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. Well, thank God we have both. So that's a problem for yep. this eradication effort, awesome. which which we haven't discussed, but which is ongoing. Right. But why are we talking about polio? Isn't isn't it almost gone? No, we were talking about it because you know all about... No, we're not talking about it. Well, in fact, this is... So what are the challenges today? Here are the challenges. So globally, in 1988, there were at least 350,000 cases a year globally. These were reported cases. There were probably twice as many. Sure. At that time, World Health Organization began an eradication campaign. They said, we're going to get rid of polio from the globe by 2000. Why would they say that about polio and not about, let's say... Salmonella or um, any other virus disease, for that matter, like influenza. Why would they say it about polio? Well, for polio, we had great vaccines, only replicates in people as far as we know. Aha. So have they ever said it before about any other virus infection? Yes. In fact, there was only one <laughs> infectious organism that's ever been eradicated, and that's smallpox. Right. And with smallpox, there was a very good vaccine. Right. And as far as we knew, it only grew in humans. Bingo. And so the difference, of course, between smallpox and polio is that when you get infected with smallpox virus, you get smallpox. Yep. And it can be seen because you get those pustules all over your body. So in the last days of the smallpox eradication campaign, uh, there was a big surveillance. Whenever there was an outbreak of smallpox or an individual with smallpox, the authorities would rush in with vaccines and immunize all the surrounding villages. Right. With polio, only one in a hundred people who are infected get poliomyelitis, which we should say is a paralytic disease. The virus, <laughs> I forgot to mention, the virus, and you ingest it, it grows in your intestine. Not yeah. only is it excreted, but right. it makes its way to your spinal cord and brain, oh, right. and you get paralyzed. Sure. But that only happens in one in a hundred infections. In a hundred infections, you're excreting virus, only one paralytic. So in that sense, it's like West Nile. For exactly. every case of West Nile, you've got another exactly. 150 people out there that have the exactly. virus but and don't have any signs. It's very symptoms. difficult to track because exactly. you can have many people <clears throat> infected and shedding but no symptoms. Right. In fact, in the U.S. just a few years ago. Now, the U.S. Uh, has not had a case of polio since the 70s. Uh-huh. In fact, our hemisphere is polio-free for many, many years. Uh, but a few years ago... A few children in an Amish village in Minnesota were found to have polio infections. Not poliomyelitis, not paralytic disease. They were infected with polio. They were shedding the virus in the stool. Now, the Amish do not 
accept vaccination. So these children were not immunized, and that's why they were infected with wow. polio. But why in the U.S., where everyone else is immunized, we haven't had polio for years, why were these children infected? Good well, question. <clears throat> as I said before, since 2000, we've been using the killed vaccine. Right. So our intestines are lo- no longer immune to the virus. Right. So it can be passed along in the population. What about the immigration to this country from other places where polio still exists? Can't that be a source of introducing the virus again? Of course, especially since you can imagine people can come in, they can be shedding virus, but they won't have symptoms. Exactly. Because if they did, they wouldn't be allowed to come into the U.S., of course. If you right. have fever and paralytic disease, you can't travel. But if you're shedding virus, no one really knows. And I suspect this happens on a daily basis in ports of entry to Absolutely. this country. I think the virus is brought in. It goes into our sewers, and it spreads. But it doesn't get very far because everyone's immune. And the- even the people who have in- no intestinal immunity, the ones born since 2000 who have received the killed vaccine, uh, once the virus gets in their blood, it's neutralized by their immune response, so we don't see any polio, unless right. Right. you're not immunized, as the Amish children were not, and then you, you get more replication. They were very lucky that they didn't get disease. There were only three or four of them, and statistically, that makes sense. You need about 100 people infected to see a case of paralytic disease. Right. So there's a there's a another source of outbreak for different other infections. I, I'm, not, I'm being vague on purpose, but bilge water from trade ships. Yes, uh, that's a very good way of transmitting cholera from one place to the next. That's a bacterial infection, of course, and we'll talk about cholera because I think it has a viral connection that we really need to connect with, along with diphtheria. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to sure. that for another time, but. Do you think bilge water from a highly polluted freshwater source where polio is endemic could be a source of the infection in port cities that don't have any polio at all? I think nowadays it's less likely because the uh, the amount of polio is much less than it was before. Okay. So currently we have about 2,000 cases a year. Okay. Um, these are mainly in uh, a few countries where polio is still circulating. We, we say the virus is endemic in these countries. Right. Nigeria. Ah. Afghanistan, huh. India, and Pakistan. There are a few countries in Africa where the disease has spread from Nigeria, but it's no longer endemic there. So these are for the four remaining countries where the virus is circulating and it's causing disease. The WHO has huge immunization efforts to try and get rid of the disease in these countries, but for some reason it's not working. And the reasons are different in each country. Nigeria, the government decided to stop immunizing a few years ago because they didn't trust the Western vaccine, the product of Western countries. Pakistan and Afghanistan, there is conflict in those countries, and it's often difficult to immunize everyone. But if we could get into Nigeria, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, we'd get rid of the disease there. India is really the thorn. There is a province in the north of India, Uttar Pradesh, where the children receive up to 10 doses of live vaccine, polio vaccine, and still contract the disease. We don't understand why it doesn't work well in India. It may be that there are so many other enteric pathogens that they interfere with the vaccine, or there may be other issues that we don't really understand. So that's why I don't think the bilge water is going to bring in enough virus, because there just isn't enough left in the globe. Gotcha. So most of the uh, world is still using the live vaccine. Okay. And remember, as long as we use it, it's, it's excreted into sewers. And uh, one thing we haven't touched on, which we should at this point, the, one of the disadvantages of this live vaccine, as I mentioned, is that it can cause polio. As it grows sure. in your intestine, it changes back to a form that can cause disease. Now, Albert Sabin uh, developed the live vaccine in his laboratory so that it's unable to cause disease. But unfortunately, once it goes into your gut, it regains some of those characteristics. And so in about one in a million doses, uh, you can get polio from the vaccine. So for the virologists out there that are not too familiar with polio, isn't it true that the vaccine is kind of a multiple of various strains? Yes. So uh, and that's the reason why it can recombine to make a live uh, virulent virus. Uh, no, it does. Well, it does recombine, but that's not why it becomes virulent. Oh, okay. So let's let's sort this out. There are three types of polio. Right. Now, last week we talked about types of West Nile virus. There are three serotypes of polio. Each of them can cause disease. So the vaccine 
has to immunize against all three serotypes. Gotcha. So when you are immunized, you get three serotypes. Right. And when they multiply in your gut, they do recombine bits of their RNA, and we, we don't actually understand why they do that. It seems to help them grow better in the gut. So it's a selection for the best fit viruses, and those turn out to exchange pieces of their RNAs. But also, the reason why these viruses become regain their ability to cause disease is that in the gut, we, it selects for uh, viruses that have mutations that are virulent again. Sure. So uh, there is uh, the, the, the mutations that make the viruses unable to cause disease make the viruses grow a little more slowly in the gut, and there's always a selection. Absolutely. You'll have one virus emerging or perhaps one virus is present in the vaccine that grows better, and it will overtake the population, and that will have the mutation that causes disease. So is there a way of marking molecularly those three strains so you can tell them apart? No matter what happens, you can see which ones have the propensity to emerge over the other two. We do. We have been able to do that. And there are many studies that can trace the evolution of these viruses in the gut. And in nearly everyone immunized, you have the same pattern. You have emergence of selection of vir- variants that recombine that can grow better and variants that are more virulent. Gotcha. So as long as we use this live vaccine... We're going to have strains in the sewer that can cause disease, and it's fine as long as everyone's immune. But what will happen if we stop immunizing one day, which is the plan of WHO? I'm going to make you the head of WHO right now, and I'm going to pay you as much money as you want and give you as many people as you want to work with you. How would you go about eradicating this disease? Is that a fair statement to eradicate or control? Well... I think at this point it can be eradicated. Yeah. WHO has done a great job up until now. They've gone from 350,000 a year to about 2,000. Some of the problems have nothing to do with what they've done, military conflicts, governments not taking vaccines. But that's part of an immunization program. You have to overcome not just the biology but social aspects, right? So I think they will eventually get rid of these 2,000 cases a year. But then the question is what do you do? And that's where I would come in. Aha. Uh-huh. So the plan now is simply to stop vaccinating. We'll wait five years. Have, if there are no cases of polio, we will stop immunizing globally. I think this is a bad idea because I think there will always be virus, polio virus in the sewage, which has come out of the vaccinees and which is virulent. And what about all those carriers? that and The carriers detected? will contribute to that as well. Sure. And so eventually, as, as you'll have new, new babies born hourly, they will not be immunized, and eventually they will be infected. And there are examples of this. In Hispaniola, a few years ago, small village. Now, in this part of the world, the whole Western Hemisphere, polio was eradicated at this time, considered to be eradicated. Small village up in the hills of Hispaniola. They stopped immunizing. Mm. What happened? They had an outbreak of polio, 20 cases of paralytic disease caused by a vaccine strain. By the way, can you name one famous American that suffered from polio that everyone and recognizes? FDR, Franklin That's Delano Roosevelt. what I was course. hoping you would say. He had polio and he founded the March of Dimes. He was the poster child adult for this infection. And he f- that foundation funded Salk and Sabin and their development of the vaccines. Absolutely essential. The March of Dimes was instrumental. So FDR's interest in this disease was essential in in developing a vaccine. What were we talking about before that? We're talking about eradicating... Once we were talking about Hispaniola and... Uh, What would I do? So Hispaniola had this outbreak. They stopped immunizing, and at the same time there were vaccine-derived, poliovirus-derived strains circulating, and those simply infected the children who weren't immunized. Exactly. So you can imagine this happening on a larger scale sure. when the world stops immunizing. Absolutely. So if you make me director of WHO, I will switch. I will wait till there are no cases of polio and then switch to the killed vaccine. Uh-huh. We will no longer be contributing to the polio virus in the environment that way because the killed vaccine – The people who are immunized don't shed vaccine, of course. They don't shed anything. And um, then we monitor the sewers, the sewage treatment plants, and see poliovirus going away. And at some point, perhaps it takes a few years, it will be completely gone, and then we can stop immunizing. Right. I was at a National Academy of Sciences meeting five years ago. Joshua Letterberg was at the head. It was about disease eradication. Mm Mm-hmm. 
and I spoke about the problems with polio. And I suggested at that time that we should switch to killed vaccine. And D.A. Henderson was at this meeting, and he's the man who who uh, did the, pol- the smallpox eradication campaign. He was at the head of that. And he said in his booming, deep voice, deeper than any voice I could call forth, <laughs> if you think we are switching to the killed vaccine, you're dreaming. Do you know what he said about a year ago publicly? I think we have to switch to killed vaccine. <laughs> but not in such a booming voice, though, so he would be heard by everybody, I bet. <laughs> so I, I think the consensus now is growing, and <clears throat> we probably will, in fact, do that. They don't need to make me head of WHO to achieve that, because I think we will switch, and it will be an experiment, because the global use of killed vaccine is far less extensive than that of the live, because the live vaccine has always been very cheap and easy to administer, so it's the vaccine of preference. So Absolutely. we don't know if killed vaccine will work everywhere, but I think we need to do that experiment. And then you've got this uh, a province in India that you have to address. Uttar Pradesh. Yep. Yeah, we have to figure out what's going on there. How many people do you think are involved in that? There are a few hundred cases a year there. It's well, not I mean, a, it's so a very heavily populated it's country. It's extremely heavily populated. The birth rate is huge. Yeah. 100, 100 million people, I think, in this region. And... New susceptibles born every day. Right. Uh, a lot of people infected for a few hundred cases. Amazing. There, are, there are tens of thousands of people infected. It's very difficult, but I think it can be done with some research and some focus. So I think eventually it will be eradicated, and if we switch to killed vaccine, it, it can work. Now, right. the, I there is one question perhaps that, People are asking, why in the U.S. should I immunize my child against polio? You really don't have a choice unless you have a letter from your priest or rabbi or someone else, which physician saying you shouldn't receive the vaccine or you object to it for religious um, reasons. If you want to go to school, otherwise you have to receive the vaccine. But parents may be saying, why do I have to? There's no polio in the U.S. So the Amish get around this by having their own schools then. They have their own schools, but they have a religious objection, which is acceptable in the U.S. Not to me, but to the authorities, it's acceptable. Um, but there is the point is there still is polio virus in the U.S. Exactly. It's brought in daily, I am sure, at airports and in, in ports okay. of call. Enough about the human stuff. Enough about the epidemiology stuff. Vince, you're a basic biologist. You're a molecular virologist. I work what on are polio the, What are the exciting... Exactly parts of polio that keeps you in the lab. Maybe I'm not in the lab. I'm podcasting now. Maybe I should be. <laughs> well, when you go back after this show, what are, you, what, well, are your, what are the big questions that you would like to see polio help you answer? Perhaps I can tell you something that was done recently with polio that's extremely exciting in a very broad way, and it will illustrate why I think it's good to work on polio. We worked on polio for many years to try and develop a vaccine. Right. Once the vaccine was developed, we continued to work on the virus because it's a great model. Model system. Now, s- model systems are becoming less fashionable these days. A model system is an organism that you work on that gives you information about other organisms which may be too dangerous to work with or you can't work with easily in the laboratory. The people who fund research these days don't like model systems. <laughs> they want you to work on the actual pathogen And they want you to have a directed research program. Polio has been great for years because it's a model system. It grows beautifully in the lab. It can be manipulated. And it does interesting things in the animal when it infects it. Is it cell type restricted in terms of its growth? Or can you use any cell? Well, in culture, you can use most cells. But in animals, it's extremely restricted. Uh This has been an interesting question for years. For example, in humans, when you ingest polio, it grows in your intestines and maybe in your spinal cord and brain if you're unlucky, if you're one out of the hundred. Why is that? Exactly, exactly. Uh, Just about a few years ago, one of my competitors in Japan figured it out. Now, I was, I was trying to figure it I would call out. those long-distance colleagues. <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy it was sorted out. It's not about us. It's about answering the questions, yeah, exactly. right? Exactly. He found out that the reason most organs are protected in a human from infection is because there's an, a robust interferon response. Oh, right. Which knocks out RNA transcripts, yes? It takes away, it prevents the virus from growing. Exactly how, we don't know, but uh-huh. it prevents it. And if you take any cell from you, let's say you take your kidney, 
and your kidney is never infected with polio if you have poliomyelitis. Never. But if you take your kidney and make a yeah, cell culture, it becomes infected because the interferon response is vastly reduced. Huh. And that's why we can grow polio vaccines in monkey kidney cultures. Gotcha. If we tried to grow them in the monkey kidney in the monkey, it would never grow. But let me tell you one fascinating result from another group, sure. which I heard about in May. The polio vaccine, the live vaccine, as you know, has this risk of what we call vaccine-associated poliomyelitis. Now, we need to do a little molecular biology to understand this result. When you have a, a nucleic acid sequence that codes for a protein, right. the protein is broken down into amino acids. And each amino acid is specified by a triplet of three nucleotides. Yep. There's a genetic code that specifies this. But as you know, the code is degenerate. One amino acid can be coded for sometimes by several, up to six codons, up to six triplets of nucleic acid. So a group at Stony Brook took the poliovirus, the part of the poliovirus gene encoding the capsid proteins, the proteins that make the shell that the virus is made of, and changed every amino acid codon to something else, but it would encode the same amino acid, but the sequence was different. He degenerated uh, right. the code. Gotcha. So now the, the capsid coding sequence is quite long. It's a few thousand nucleotides. He changed almost every other base. <laughs> and this virus now makes the same protein, but when put into an animal, it does not cause polio. It grows pretty well, but it's completely attenuated. It's like a vaccine. But wait a minute. What's the antigenic part of the virus? The capsid. Exactly. He and hasn't that changed remained it. unchanged. Unchanged because he just made the changes. The code that, was different. Exactly. The code That's was remarkable. different. That's remarkable. So just changing the RNA made the virus sick enough so it doesn't cause disease. Does it slow it down then? Slightly. But a Gives vaccine it a is better slow. chance to make. Uh, now, now, let's say there are 3,000 changes in this sequence. I don't know the exact number. We'll put the link in the show notes wow. for the paper. It's published in Science not long ago. It's hard for a virus to get around that kind of a block, isn't it? So here's the thing. The pol let's say one of the three serotypes in, of polio, type 3, the vaccine strain that Albert Sabin made has three mutations that make it unable to cause disease. How long do you think it takes for those to be selected against in the gut? Sounds like a couple of hours to yeah, me. But uh, within a day or two, <clears throat> they're, sure. they're all gone. Sure. This has 3,000. It yeah, probably exactly. won't happen. Exactly. This will probably be the most stable vaccine. There will probably no, be no vaccine-associated disease if people were given this, this virus. Even so, as a live virus. Even as a live virus. So maybe it so could be used for the eradication. Okay. And then we won't have to worry about being in the sewers because it can't cause polio. Now, now my enemies will say <laughs> eventually it's going to revert anyway. It will change and become virulent. Even 3,000 bases, I don't know how long that will take. It's a good theoretical problem. Uh, I think you'd need a supercomputer to figure that one out, Vince. And uh, maybe the virus itself is a supercomputer in some ways. But it sounds to me that if I had a choice between a three mutant or a 3,000 3, mutant strain to take, I would take that 3,000 strain every and time. Of course, it has to be tested. That's a tricky part, isn't it? Because humans are the only hosts. And do you know... We How have are you going to do this? So we have a vaccine that gives, let's say, one case in a million recipients of of disease. That's the rate of side effects. So what size clinical trial would you need to show that yours is at least as good or better? At least a few million people. And that's very difficult. We so, need a few million seronegative people to test Do you know what the restrictions thing. are for other animals that prevents them from becoming infected? Is it a receptor? It is a receptor. Can we engineer that receptor into a mouse? It's been done. It was done in my laboratory Can you here. then give mice polio? Yes, we can. Well, then in that case, we can start testing this, can't we? Yes, you can test it in mice, but eventually you do have to test it in people, of first course. for safety and then for efficacy. Wow. And it may take quite a large clinical trial. Where would you I'm go for sure. this, do you think? I know where I'd go. I'd go I'd... to Hoboken, probably. You would? No, no, no. <laughs> I don't know where I'd go. You would not You would ideally like to have seronegative What about children. Uttar Pradesh? I Uttar bet Pradesh? No, but you can't. Tested as a as a way of well, it's seeing just a substituting a vaccine. Now. It's just a vaccine. Substitution. You could test it in India. You could test it anywhere where you have enough of a where population. You had the problem. Where you had the where problem. Where you have seronegative people who have not been infected, and they don't have a hope against and, eradicating uh, it otherwise. You know, and when Sabin, uh, a story which we didn't finish, Albert oh, Sabin sure. was rebuffed by the public health service in the fifties. They didn't want his vaccine. Do you know what he did? <laughs> 
he went to the Soviet sure. Union because he had come from there. And he had a friend, the head of virology in the Soviet Union, a man by the name of Chumakov, who headed the virology institute there. He said, Dr. Chumakov, would you test my strains? And he welcomed him with open arms. Of they did course. a clinical trial, 100 million people. Wow. And declared to be safe and effective. He came back with the data and the U.S. couldn't refuse, and that's why it was licensed here in the U.S. So, And by the way, <laughs> Chumakov's son is now at the FDA here really? in the U.S., and he's a wonderful right? scientist who works <laughs> on, among other things, polio vaccines. That's a great circle. And plus, one of the great places to go study all this is the Sabine Institute, <laughs> right? It's in Cincinnati. Isn't there a, a big vaccine group there? I don't know. I thought there was, actually. I'm not sure. I knew his grandson, by the way. He was a School of Public Health student here, at, right here at Columbia University, mm -hmm. Michael Sabine. So he talked fondly about his grandfather. So have we made a good case for continuing polio immunization in the U.S.? Um, as far as I'm concerned. I don't want parents not to immunize their children against this or, or any other. Understood. But we'll cover them one by one. We'll talk about this extensively. But for polio, you need, you need to use it. You need to take it. It's available as a freestanding vaccine by itself. You get it in the first month of life. You get three uh, doses of it. And in the U.S. now, it's a killed vaccine. We switched in 2000 from the live, from Sabin's vaccine to the killed, back to the killed. So after Sabin came back from the Soviet Union, yep. we switched in 1961 from Salk's to Sabin's vaccine in the right. U.S. That got rid of the rest of the poliomyelitis in this country. Right. We switched back to the killed vaccine in 2000. Do you know why? I'm not a virologist. Remember, I'm a poor parasitologist just trying to make his way because through life. Because the only cases of polio in the U.S. were caused by the vaccine, 7 uh, to 80 a years. Reversion, a reversion. So now we switch to the sure. killed vaccine. There's no longer any vaccine-associated exactly. polio. But we need to get this in the U.S. You have to take it because there is virus coming into the U.S. And if you're not immunized, you're going to get polio eventually. Right. So let's take the other guy. I mean, Sabin... There is a vaccine institute down in Washington area someplace where the, that it actually does has, have his name. There is it. a vaccine research institute That's right. on the NIH campus. That's correct. Then there's this other place on the West Coast. <laughs> it's called the Salk Institute. <laughs> and you can see the advantages of making a discovery early and then exploiting it both uh, biologically and economically. Um, I think... Uh, that has uh, actually f uh, spawned a generation of very, very high-talented uh, and high-quality uh, neurologists, virologists, molecular biologists. The, the Salk Institute is one of those great places that uh, that came up as the result of uh, exploiting a biological result that had some relevance to human health. Absolutely. Well, Salk became a cultural hero, of course. Absolutely right. And so he could raise money, and he founded this yep. institute as yep. a consequence. Yep. And that's a good thing, because now they do many, many other kinds of science there. Exactly. And I think that's the best way that science should proceed. Totally right? agree. Shall we wrap this up, Dick? We shall. All right, that was polio. We will put some show notes up at... Uh, www.twiv.tv <coughs> Send in your questions And we might want to give you a heads up As to next week's topic I don't know what we're doing next week yet. I do Do you? Yeah, we're doing vector-borne viral infections Vector-borne viral infections All right. We're going to continue the West Nile story But now let's talk about dengue fever Okay, and dengue yellow, would be great And yellow fever There have been some interesting new developments with dengue and we'll keep an eye on ProMed, see if there are any outbreaks and if there are some interesting things. And in the next few weeks, what, what viral infection season are we moving into now as we leave the West Nile season? Well, it's called Eastern Equine Encephalitis. And There's another one. I'm thinking. <laughs> That's right. What, what other virus <laughs> season, which you should go get your immunization for soon? Well, I would call that the flu season. Flu season is coming up, so we will have to talk about flu. Absolutely. And you know I did do my Ph.D. thesis on influenza virus. Did you? I did, in, in the lab of Peter Palazzi, one of the oh, wow. preeminent wow. flu virologists in the world Perhaps who was we'll here from him in New York City. Yeah, we'd Wouldn't love to Wouldn't it be hear nice to have him join us? Let's do it. We would have to go to his office. That's not a problem. I don't mind, but, but I think we need to be able to start calling people on phones and have them here with us, you and I here, and sure. have them Skyping in or something like that so we don't have to go everywhere in the world and we can That'd just call great. people up. We'll That'd figure this out. But hopefully that you'll stay interested in TWIV and follow us. Yep. Okay, thanks for listening. See you next time. See you next time. That's right.